Hi, this is Joseph Arthur. Thanks for checking out Come to Where I'm From. Please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash come to where I'm from. We are an independent podcast, and any contributions you can make are greatly appreciated. I love that it's cold in here. Yeah? Yeah, I always ask for it to be like... Freezing? Yeah. This is like talk show temperature. Exactly. Letterman cool. That's to keep us awake. That's right. (laughs) Do you need this... Keep us energetic. That's right. (laughs) Do you need this this close? Yeah. That's good? Okay. Yeah, it's good. Cool. Good distance. So what's going on? What's going on? I've been off the road for three or four weeks. I always take September off. I have two, I have four kids, but two are still, you know, going to school in the lower grades. Um, so I like to be home when they're starting a, a new year of school. With, yeah. So uh, that's my other job, yeah. <laughs> which I love. But uh, it's been great being off the road. And now I'm, now it's time to go back. I start getting a little because you just Fancy. made a record with Blind Boys of Alabama? I did, which was the result of a lot of shows with them and a love for gospel music, and that was thrilling. That goes in line with uh, your style, I feel like. I think so. I mean, it, I always loved gospel music. It's sort of inherent in the way I put background singers on a lot of the tracks. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was just going for the real thing. Right. Man, they're about as real as it gets, man. It's so great yeah have you ever heard them <coughs> live I, especially I was label mates with them oh right real That's world right. yeah yeah real world records so did you meet no I don't think so I don't think I ever met them no I yeah. mean just in, in yeah. a real world record catalog right right you'd love them man. they're just great <laughs> yeah great people Ben Harper made some music with That's them as right. well they've collaborated with a lot of people. I mean, yeah. Bon Iver, they did some tracks with. Right. Uh, Taj Mahal. I mean, it's like an enormous list. They're great collaborators. Although they're also very particular about what they'll sing. Yeah. Jimmy Carter, who's the oldest living member of the band, the group. The president? The, nah, well, he's, he should be. He, he's in there? <laughs> I didn't know that. It's a different. It's a, how did he end up in the blind boy? Is that boys? the new version? <laughs> <laughs> he's like no. more short-sighted i he feel is. like than... well he's a hell of a peanut farmer <laughs> yeah um, no it's a different jimmy carter who's 88 the short-sighted boys of alabama <laughs> they had to change the name uh, that's actually the group i made a record with <laughs> that's your problem right there there you go i'm so glad i came you gotta here go to full work blind. that out yeah <laughs> So, Mark Cohn. That's me. That's how you say it. Yes. Mark Cohn. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah. He's here with us today. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, um, you're from Ohio as well? Yeah, Cleveland. I'm from Akron. That's what I thought. Yeah. Midwest. Here we are. Look look how far we've come. I know. How long have you been in New York? Uh, 30 years. Okay. How about you? You got me beat a little bit. About like 25, I think. Yeah. Something like that. I think it may be more than 30 for me. But yeah, yeah, this feels more like home than Cleveland. Yeah. Oh, for for sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do you get back there? Just to play, just to do a show, Mm. you know, so maybe once a year. Right. It's sort of a ghost town for me. Uh, Yeah. Everybody in my family either moved or passed away. Right. Um, And and a lot of, you know, my mom and dad passed away when I was really young. So Cleveland is a very bittersweet town for me. I feel you. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. I have ghosts. You yeah. do. Yeah. Of Maybe course. Maybe we all do. Right. Of from course. Where we came from. Yeah. We get old enough, ghosts happen. <laughs> There's a song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ghosts happen. <laughs> ghosts happen. <laughs> That's good. That's not bad, is it? <laughs> I don't know. Should we turn off everything and go right? <laughs> Probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm just learning how to do that. Yeah. To just like let everything else go by the wayside so I can focus on that. How do you do that? Not well. Not well. I mean, there was, a, I don't know about you, man, but when I was much younger and didn't have kids, mm-hmm. didn't have two ex wives and yeah. a fiance, yeah. um, music was everything. So right. I didn't have to make time for music. I, I had to make time to eat because I was always doing music. In the flow and in the passion of yeah, it. Yeah, but that's changed. You know, I don't know if it has to or it had to, but. Now I have to really focus on leaving time for myself to write and try. I, I don't know about you. Are you one of these guys that has a habit? You sit down and you start writing every morning no matter what? No, but I wish I was. 
I, well, I'm I with aspire, you. I'm in your group. I aspire to be that guy. Me too. Like the Ernest Hemingway. I don't even know if Ernest Hemingway did it, but just like those writers that wake up at like five in the morning and they're like, I, I write for the first four hours starting at 4 a.m. You know, like I wish I was that. I do too. So I'm trying to get to that. Do you know this book, The Art of War? Yeah. So that is kind of what I just finished and reading the, a few weeks the ago. The Art of War or The War of Art? There's, there's, there's like well, a, the I'm talking art. about the one about creativity. Okay, then I think that's the war of art. The war of art. That's what art, I mean. Art Did I say war. the art of war? Yeah, which is the... Well, which, along that, that's with, the, with Jimmy Carter and that, I'm yeah. totally fucking it up. Well, you got Jimmy Carter <laughs> reading the art of war to you when, when you're going to bed, bro. That's, that's, why, that's uh, why you're messed up. I, it's, I mean, first of all, we haven't established I'm messed up, but okay, I know, you're right. I keep saying you're right. that. Well, I don't know why. I apologize. <laughs> it's just part of this no, you're right. comedic riff I'm trying you're to right. get on. No, you know? Happened, your comedic riff has led to something deep and accurate. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, you know, it's projection. <laughs> okay. Straight up. Oh, uh, there you go. Because, I believe in that. yeah, it's like I think we're all messed up every day. It's like a, yeah. to me, is a battle to get unmessed up. Like I wake up, mm. start, the start point is messed up. And what is that? What is that messed I mean, up? I'm being, feeling? I'm sort of, do you want to lie down? <clears throat> I'm only yeah. about a $200 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna be even after this podcast. Yeah, I think we yeah, are definitely. Okay. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a good rate, Mark. That's yeah. pretty good. You're right. Let's call it three. Okay. Yeah, you should increase it and then get me the bro rate of two hundred. <laughs> so your normal rate's three hundred, but for a bro Ohio <laughs> rate, Ohio rate, Ohio rate. But yeah, I, no, it's just every day's a, uh, about getting a state of mind together that's mm. optimistic and positive and mm. there's so many factors coming into all of our lives that are mm. trying to dismantle that and that's why artists first albums are oftentimes like up or up there because of what you're saying they're so mm. focused and the world hasn't yet tried to like come in and fuck with them yet exactly you know exactly and so i get a work it stop being fucked with yeah but so what about this book the uh, war of art well it's just it basically talks about resistance and how powerful it is in all of us mm -hmm. and how it's working its evil magic uh, every day, you know, and right. every day you don't put aside the things that keep you from your calling mm -hmm. is not a good day. <laughs> right, I agree. Uh, and I've had a lot of those days. I'm just realizing how many days I've spent not working on what I feel is the biggest reason I'm here, you know, which yeah. is to make music, to sing, yeah. to connect. Um, so it's a pretty brutal book to, to read because it really just comes around and says, if you're not one of those guys, and I'm not sure if we decide we agree, but if you're not one of those guys who wakes up and starts working on what it is you're put here to do, mm -hmm. um, you're, not, uh, you're not a pro yet. Wow. I, I, he does, I don't know if he puts it exactly that way, but yeah. it's close. Yeah. And reading it was sort of like, fuck, what, yeah. what am I? I mean, I, yeah. I know I've done good work. I've moved people. I've told my story the best I can. But I am in a place where I'm like, what now? What, am I, what do I want to write about? Yeah. Um, so it, it's, first there's just how do I deal with the resistance? And if I sit down, which I've started to every day, to write something at a piano or you know in a journal um is that even what i want to be doing i don't know yeah well it's like yeah it's that question that i think could be the enemy like is this mm. even what i want to be doing because it, that could also be like a gen like a seemingly genuine voice but it's actually the voice of depression like wearing a and resistance wearing That's a right. disguise like going, right. i'm your friend exactly is this really what you want to be doing because i'm your you're buddy right. and it's like yeah no you're, no, not, you're not my not. friend yeah you're fucking with me exactly that's what you are <laughs> yeah man that's right <laughs> you know what i'm saying but see, you know that you, oh yeah because it's like yeah because but I'm, that hasn't led you to sit down and make a routine of your calling that's true i mean I would say like I do get into routines like mm. I'm more of like a, a binge routiner if that's a thing you know like right. where like if I'm w working towards a project or something yeah. I can tend to be very focused but um, you know like today I did wake up and play guitar and I like mm. went to sleep playing guitar and I like you know there like you uh, and I'm getting into like finger picking and making these arrangements and so like you, I think mm. you have to engage that sort of playful aspect of yourself yeah. and that like sort of teenage aspect of yourself that's like 
Maybe if like also you're like, let me get better at finger picking. And then all of a sudden you're tricking. Was that a conscious thing or just started happening? It just started happening, but I realized I could maybe develop this further mm. and like, and, and yeah, and just kind of, yeah, do something sort of special in mm. this realm, you know? Cool. Um, and so then that's a trick, like tricking yourself into kind of like, yeah, you know, in, engaging the party yourself that wants to be good at a video game, for <laughs> instance, like in right. tricking that guy to come to the party. Yeah. And then that guy all of a sudden starts writing songs, even though he's <laughs> just playing a video game. I like it. You know what I mean? I like it. So, I mean, I know you're supposed to be asking the no, questions. No, it's but a conversation. I'm curious. Um, what did I want to ask you? So, how much do you actually know about music? Like, do you know theory and what the rules are? And Not really. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I... Me neither. Yeah, I don't... You know, I mean, I know what keys are. And, right. You know, I know how to jam and, like, if you said A blues, I you would... You could do I something. Could, you could I lay would, something down. I could lay something down. But, like, I, yeah, intense theoretical knowledge right. isn't, like... I'm not packed with it upstairs. Me neither, man. In fact, I had one of the most embarrassing moments on stage where it was a... Uh, songwriters in the round kind of thing one of the last shows at the bottom line Remember I the did one line? of those did you yeah and I was there with Roseanne Cash and Lucinda Williams and somebody else and Luc and I was the only one there with a keyboard right uh -huh. and I don't know what I'm doing right. when I write my songs and I certainly don't know what I'm doing trying to play somebody else's song I have yeah. to work on that for a long time right and in the middle of a song I did not know by Lucinda, yeah. Lucinda just said very innocently and sweetly, Mark, take the solo. <laughs> 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 and I didn't know what key That's we were in. I didn't bro. know the song. You know, and I knew in my heart of hearts, you know, there's a million guys that should be up here that could just wail away on this song and sound great. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know what I did, but I'm sure it was horrifying. Right. Um, <laughs> so thanks, Lucinda. <laughs> I haven't that's, spoken to him since. That's, that's right. hysterical. What was that? Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. I would have probably gone in for like a one note type. So like, do, do, like probably that. what I did. Like, like, like a know, Leonard like, Cohen. Right, do, like, do, just do, like do, super do. minimal. I, right. I would try to find three notes that fit. Right, everybody going, wow, that's hit, deep. hit that one sour note and be like, no, not that one. Okay. You know, that routine. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's pretty much what it was, man. Right. I have a feeling. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the bottom line that was uh, mm. that was a good one. I miss that place. Yeah, but you took like a long time off in your career too. Several times. Se several times. Yeah. And what? Um, and did you just like put songwriting aside at that point, or was, yeah. what? What happened? You know, I don't mean to make light of this. I mean, looking back on it, um, I had really bad uh, panic disorder. Um, and some agoraphobia and you know t so there you go we're back to being messed up mm -hmm. um i needed time to have a couple nervous breakdowns as it turns out that isn't what i was calling them at the time right but looking back i think that's what it was right i was deeply unhappy and uh a lot of it had to do with my my marriage my first marriage that was the first time is it an abusive relationship no it wasn't it was just uh wasn't meant to be where I spent the rest of my life. Right. And I knew that, and I already had young kids, mm -hmm. and when you have kids, yeah. it becomes very difficult yeah. to know what doing the right thing is. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, you know, I just uh, I felt like it was the best thing for everybody, you know, that we be real honest, and we worked on it, you know, uh, tried to make it work, but it didn't. So anyway, that to make a very long story short, I think it was largely an emotional crisis you know mm -hmm. that led me to just drop everything and I even had a really bad panic attack on stage and for me that freaked me out because mm. that was the one place I counted on feeling safe mm -hmm. and once it crept into that I just was like I, I need to reassess what's going on here mm. find out what's happening what why am I feeling this way and it, it was largely just stuff unresolved stuff from you know touring and writing and that whole cycle mm -hmm. i didn't pay attention to my life right and it was crumbling yeah so i needed to put it all aside and take care of the the crumbling yeah take care of mark yeah i guess that's what it came down to yeah yeah, yeah. a you couple ever, of times how did you get back on your feet uh, i had some really good friends 
that were very uh, encouraging and sort of said, okay, it's time. It's time to get back on your feet. Let's go do a gig downtown or let's go play. <laughs> um, and, you know, a lot of therapy, <laughs> a lot of talking about what was happening. Mm -hmm. And that gave me a lot of, uh, a little more serenity just you know exploring what was happening the more i find for me the more i understand about this stuff and what's going on emotionally internally the better off i am and sometimes it can be really scary i mean sometimes there's no other way than to just feel like shit mm -hmm. and you have to deal with that yeah um and not be so scared of it i was always scared of being depressed and anxious and i'm less so now mm. um and that helps i'm scared of it it's scary. Man, I don't, it's scary. When I get depressed or get see it coming in, I like I go for a run now. Mm. Like I like I try to yeah. amp it back up because you know the demons are like click, mm. clipping at my heels. It seems. Like. Yeah, man. Are they old? The demons? Yeah. I guess so. Yeah, mm. it's like uh, addiction is mm. is one I grapple with. You mm. know? Like I mean, in all its weird disguises. Yeah, man. You it's know? hard. Yeah, it's and very, so very hard. if I convert it to like a yoga practice or like running in a box and I put my addiction, I find especially with physical fitness, just because mm. getting oxygen, yeah, getting out into the sun on a run for vitamin D, all that kind of stuff, I, I find is really important. And then the yoga thing is just like this naturally healing thing, like opening your body up like that. Yeah, man. So I do a lot of that kind Good of stuff. Good for you. Yeah. I do some of that. I don't do yoga, but being in the gym for me is really important. It's mm -hmm. harder on the road, but when I'm home, I try to make it, you know, like five times a week, do something that yeah. makes me sweat. Yeah. Yeah, that's big time. Yeah. So in the in the war of art, too, mm. it doesn't he, like, talk about, like, being play, keeping a playful, like, vibe mm. about art? Or, I mean, even if, regardless Maybe. of whether he does, I think that's like... Well, like you just said, you bring the video game video guy. Game guy. You, you yeah. got to have your inner 13-year-old or 15-year-old still engaged. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like... Yeah, I'm going to take that with me. That's, that's an a, interesting way to look I at it. I think that's a good one. My 13-year-old, probably you too, was just when I was falling in love with music. Yeah. I mean, my dad had just died, but the I... beginner's mind. Yeah, man. It's when it got... Whatever I heard when I was that age... Yeah got to me the deepest and it still has the strongest hold on me mm. like there's very little past the, you know 1978 that i care about as much as i did those early records i heard when i was you know uh 10 11 12 years old how'd your dad die he had a heart disease oh, okay. and he was he was 60 when i was born so he right. was an old dude to begin oh, with okay. as i was growing up but my mom died when i was two wow and he survived. I mean, he was still alive, but for all intents and purposes, he died then too. He just when she passed. Yeah, yeah. And I had three older brothers that helped take care of me, and he remarried. So I had a stepmother uh, from the time I was about five. But I feel like I lost both of them when I was two and a half. Wow. Even though it was really when I was twelve that he died. But amazingly, he was a huge fan of the Cleveland Indians. My dad. Uh huh. And I hated baseball. Hated I, it. Wouldn't I, watch it. I didn't like baseball yeah. either. I loved and, football. Yeah, I did too. And of course, you know, if the you're Browns. from Cleveland, the Browns. Fuck yeah, it was. And now the Browns. Everybody loves Coming, the Browns. I know. It's, where did that come I don't, from? I know. I don't get it. I'm just like it's confusing to me because I know. It's like, where I, did they come from? Like, <laughs> why are the Browns everybody's favorite team, even in New York fucking city? I'm not. Right. I'm, what am I missing? Anyway, I know. Anyway, he I'm was happy. Go Browns. Yeah, me too. Uh, anyway, he was watching the, the Indians, God bless him. I had just come back from a trip visiting one of my older brothers in Colorado. And he was, it's very interesting. I haven't told this story in a while. When I left for this trip, we had some kind of fight, my dad and me. I don't remember what it was about, but we weren't getting along. And I came back kind of hoping to repair that, you mm -hmm. know, from this trip. And he was there to pick me up at the airport, which was really unexpected. Mm. And my stepmother said, he's been really weird today. He's been unusually connected and wanting to be nice. Mm -hmm. And like five hours later, while watching a ball game, he was gone. Wow. That was it. He and you were with him? him? I was with him. I undid his tie, you know, tried to get him to <laughs> wow. start breathing. These days, I have a feeling he would have survived because they know what to do with heart attacks 
you know, a little bit better. This was 72. Um, and he was still alive when they carried him out of the apartment, but that was how he died. Um, and I, it's, you know, it's obviously something I really regret. I don't really know who my parents were, you know, right. as, as an adult, I never got to interact with them, but, uh, that gave me a lot to write about. Yeah. Those things are hard to know. I think yeah. who our parents really anyway, are right. and who anyone, even that's if, right. It's hard to know who you really are. Yes, it is. You know, but we're working on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that had to be like, you know, massively traumatic. Yeah, I mean, like, go, it still it's rears Captain, its head. Captain Obvious over here. But, <laughs> you know, no, I re- really, Matt. It was no big deal. No, it was <laughs> no it biggie. Was, it was tra- it was traumatic, but not that I would have traded this. But um, you know, I, songwriting became really important. You mm-hmm. know, I did have things I needed to try to figure out, and a lot of my song early songs, and songs on my first record are you know explicitly about my mom and dad. They're yeah. just. Uh, very overt, explicit ways I'm clearly trying to work something through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I heard you talk in an interview, too, about how when you get into this vulnerable place, that's mm-hmm. when your best stuff comes. Like when yeah. you got shot, right. that whole thing, and then you came back and ma- made right. the record from this more vulnerable, like... Yeah, fragile place. Fragile place. Yeah, I needed to write. Yeah. I so, needed to write. Yeah, like, that's the thing. Like, Herman Hess says, the best stuff comes from necessity. I think he's right. Yeah. So then we're back to, so what do you do in those moments when you don't feel it's a necessity, but you want to be working? Right. Right. Call on that 12-year-old video game dude, I guess. Yeah, he can help. Give him a call. He can help. (laughs) Invite him to the party. Right. But, um... Yeah, no, you're right. You did a little research there. A little bit. I like it. Yes, (laughs) but, um... Yeah, I just... Because you're songs like when they're their best are just sound like i don't know they're just they you can hear the inspiration in mm. the in the lyrics and stuff well, that's you, nice yeah and they, and they have like an effortlessness to them it's so interesting mm. to see the back end how much you kind of struggle mm. and i and, and i'm not putting you in on your own there i think we all do but sure because your songs don't have like or the best ones don't have that sense of sh- struggle they see, right. they sound effortless right and probably some of them might have been right I mean, some of them were yeah uh, but some of them weren't and i'm good at covering it up but yeah i feel the same way when i listen to yours okay um same thing i feel like wow where did that came from somewhere else mm-hmm. that right you, know, you called upon something without knowing it exactly or maybe because you're so fucking tall you grab the good ones i grab first. the good ones up high <laughs> yeah i'm up high you and james <laughs> taylor you're up there yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but that's cool. So, like, so when you were, so who took care of you then? Your stepmom? Uh, or? Before she came along, there were a few years before she came along, my, my oldest brother, who's now almost 80. Oh, so he, he way quit older. school. Yeah, I he. See. I had three way older brothers. Yeah, they so weren't they, expecting me. I was a total accident. My next youngest brother was 14 years older, okay. 12 years older. But my oldest brother quit school. I quit college for about a year. When your and dad he, passed. Yeah, and he, he just hung out with me. Okay. Um, which is pretty amazing. Pretty amazing thing. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then my stepmother came into the picture, and she was, you know, kind of clueless as far as how to raise a little kid. She was from Germany and already middle-aged and had never had kids, but she did the best she could, and I, I think she definitely gave me some stability. I'll tell you one thing Mm -hmm. I really appreciate about her now. She introduced me to art. Mm. Um, One of our next door neighbors was George Zell. Do you know that name? Yeah. Cleveland Orchestra Conductor, really famous conductor. He was our next door neighbor and had a crush on both my mother Uh and my stepmother. So he invited us to all these concerts. Yeah, he was, (laughs) and I think he was. Good old George um, with his baton. Um, so <laughs> that baton was that sexy. Baton. <laughs> George's sexy baton. That's the name of my short story. I'm in a, I'm I like it. Right now. I like it. Anyway, he invite. She took me to a lot of these concerts, and then took me, you know, to where she was born. So I went to a lot of museums in Europe when I was a kid. Anyway, she was important too, but didn't understand how somebody like me who couldn't read or write music Mm -hmm. would ever be able to have a career in music. So she wasn't very supportive where that was concerned. And I've since learned that was probably a good thing. 
I think that a lot of kids and all the support they get from everybody saying, you can do it, you can do it, that's great, and I'm sure it's wonderful, but I also think it's good to have somebody that says, I don't think you can fucking do this. Yeah. And you go, yeah, yeah, I can. I'll mm -hmm. show you I can. Mm -hmm. There was something in s good about that for me. Right. And the funniest part is, even after I had done well and made a record that sold, and I think I, I'd already won a Grammy, my stepmother wrote, sent me an article from the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and the headline was, Doctor Still Finds Time for Cello. So that was her way of saying, but, but you're really going to get a job. I right? get it. <laughs> I, I understand that kind of communication. You do? Oh, yeah. Is that your mother? <laughs> well, uh... Let's get into it. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm definitely schooled in the sort of I'm not saying that your stepmother has narcissistic personality disorder. No, go right ahead. <laughs> but that go M right that ahead. MPD level of communication. Yeah. The things that are like sort of you know in, on the back end or like the passive aggressive, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you yeah, had that too. All, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I am beginning to think almost all of us too. Everybody like yeah. You know, I woke up to the, that disorder in a big way a few years ago and mm. kind of made some serious changes in my life and mm. have been sort of going on that trajectory Good for you. ever since. Yeah. Yeah, man. And I mean, I'm on the YouTube videos, like uh, educating myself like, oh, so that's what gaslighting is. What is gaslighting? Fill me in. Um, well, gaslighting is like... Um, <clears throat> it's based on this movie from the 40s called Gaslight. Chaplin? Oh, I don't think was so. Was it Chaplin? I don't, no. I don't know. I've actually never seen the movie. I but either. the premise is like um, a guy drives his wife crazy by like flickering the lights. And she's like, wow. the lights are flickering. And he's like, uh, no, they're not. Like, wow. well, it's like, so it's basically like if somebody says something like that triggers you mm -hmm. and then you go, why did you say this thing? And, you're, and they're, they're like, what are you? what are you talking about? Like, mm. I, I didn't say that. Like, you're doing that thing again. Right. Like, and so, you know, like, why are you being like this again? Like, we, starting to feel anxious right now. Yeah, actually. no, it's awful. <laughs> it's awful. But yeah. like, so, but like so many toxic relationships, like play with all these tactics. And then there's like, you know, 20 of these tactics. So gaslighting is just in the toolbox. So it's like, but mm. then it's also triangulation yeah, is, yeah. An, is another good one. You know what that is? I do. Yeah. It's like comparing you to somebody else or like, right. you know, or trying, you know, all these kinds of things. It gets very toxic. Yeah. yeah. Or just like, yeah, it gets really toxic really quick. And it's like, I think mm. it relates to what we were talking about before, because I think like if you aren't actively trying to aim your creative soul towards an an objective like songwriting or podcasting or painting or ballet dancing or mm. it doesn't have to even be art but just some sort of creative endeavor because yeah, human yeah. beings are complex creatures then then i think everybody who thwarts themselves in those kind of ways then starts that creative muscle turns dark and goes towards toxic behavior of mm. which then they get very creative and very skilled at it mm. so in other words like if somebody is pointed towards art and stuff like that they're going to be like an easy prey for somebody who's thwarted all that but then is just constantly thinking about how they can like fuck with somebody mm. and manipulate and be you know a sort of interspecies yeah, yeah. predator you know so the answer is yes you know about this <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've done a little bit of research yeah. <laughs> you know do you know that here's another book that comes to mind while you're talking you ever heard of the drama of the gifted child of course right? yeah alice uh miller yeah alice miller mm -hmm. yeah so that to me was a really important thing to read too around what we're talking about that yeah. idea of i even wrote a song called let me be your witness you know that part where uh -huh. she says if you grew up with somebody, anybody, it could be, a, you know, preferably your mom or dad, but because you can't presume that, just a friend or brother, cousin, somebody that sees you for who you really are without all that narcissistic haze mm -hmm. in front of their eyes, then you've got a chance at being relatively stable. 
Mm. But the truth is, how many of us had that witness, mm -hmm. right? Somebody that really could see us. I did have one, and I, my one of my older brothers, and I think he's the reason, I, you know, I kind of made it through all the bullshit, all mm -hmm. the difficulty, with some sense of what it is to love and be loved and let that in my life. But, you know, like and did I said, you pray? Did you believe in God? Did you turn to God? Not, not overtly. Mm. No, I can't say I did that. That wasn't it for me. You didn't pray. I didn't pray. Still don't. Man, I I did. You did. Oh yeah, but I like uh, I don't. It's not to to me. It's like yeah. It's like mm. I needed something like that. How? At what age did you start doing? When that? I was a kid. Wow. And I never went to church. I had no, there was wow. no religious guidance in that way at all. There was not really. Hmm. Was what was the concept? Agnostic. Who, was just, who were you praying to? Did you have a sense? A God, like God, I just felt like there was like a protector and a creator mm. and like somebody who was paying attention to me. And that must have helped. Oh, dude, I could, I don't know how people don't do huh. that. And nobody had to, honestly, nobody had, I don't. I'm, wow. And I'm I mean, like, I probably I'm, do it. Maybe it doesn't exist, but like to me, I still need that hmm. feeling. Like, and when I when I have moments of doubt, that's like when I'm truly feeling like alone. Hmm. So, and hmm. when if somebody says, "Oh, that's weakness," I'm like, "Yeah, okay, M hmm. maybe you'll it, take it." Yeah, fine, <laughs> I, I get it. Like that is a crutch, but it's like it could be a. It that's could, a weird way of looking at it. I well, it know. is though. It is a crutch. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like a, you know, psychological security blanket. Yeah. So. You know, like you got a big old... God, God forbid God. you feel comfortable for a few minutes, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as, as my Jewish friends will all say. Are you yeah. Jewish? No. No. No, but people often think I am. Yeah, I, want, I was wondering about it. Because I was, th on the way over here, I was w wondering, actually, if you were going to ask about if God was going to come up somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and I just remember thinking, I always think to myself... I don't know what I believe or don't believe. I'm just a good searcher, which is kind of yeah. what Jews are good at. You know, yeah. everybody else was like, Jesus came along and everybody was like, this is the man. Mm -hmm. This is the this is the guy we've been waiting for. And the Jews were like, let's keep walking. <laughs> it's hot in the desert, but we're just not sure. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I how I feel about it. I'm 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 good with continuing to search for whatever yeah. uh, gives me solace and, you know, I don't think it's any accident that I've worked with the Blind Boys of Alabama and Mavis Staples and yeah. you know people that have a, a deep connection to religion. And on and on uh, walking in Memphis, you say you're Christian. Yeah, that's right, ma'am. I am tonight. Yeah. You am. I right. love that line. Yeah, me too. I really. That's such a good <laughs> line because it's like it has within it all that kind of searching in it. Because yeah. it's like I I don't know. I'm not always. You know, but, but, I, but I'm feeling, I'm believing now. Right, exactly. That's what's great about it. Yeah. And that you chose to say Beale Street, too. Like, mm. That's also cool. Well, it, it also, I think that sold a lot of records, actually, because it made people go, what the fuck is he saying? It's they had great. to go buy the record yeah. to look, uh, look at the lyric. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you question that? Like, did you think, oh, no one's going to know what I'm talking about? Or did, was that just one of those? Sort of. Just felt right. Yeah, the whole, that song came pretty easily. I can tell. Yeah. You can tell. So I wish that I wish I knew where I could go next. To oh, you that got up. you got that, you got that in you. Yeah, it's hard to re. Um, it's hard to find. It can be hard to find. It can it can come back through Ho'oponopono. Through what? Ho'oponopono. All right. What's which that? is I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. Hmm. And it's a mantra of of forgiveness and self and taking responsibility for everything in your field of consciousness. Tell me one more time. So it's, I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you. I love you, I'm sorry, please, please forgive, forgive me, me, I thank you. you. I and what you, did you I'm call sorry. it? Ho'oponopono. It's a Hawaiian wow. mantra prayer. I'll send you like a, please. some stuff about that because then you can like anything disturbing you, you can like let it wash over those, those things or kind of apply mm. it to those things. And what it does is it frees up, um, you know, because all that sort of like when you're like, thinking about negative things then that's when you're blocking out inspiration and you're living mm. from memory mm. but if you free that up then you can start living from inspiration again so how different is that from your early praying uh probably it's related yeah you know and seems like it yeah because I, I i work with that mantra that's what i'm talking about like when i wake up i'll go on a run and have that in my headphones mm. for an hour and like 
then go to a hot yoga class and then start my day, you know, something wow. like that. That sounds good. Well, it's like what I got to do. What do you have to do? To yeah. get, and, if I don't, and if I don't do it, I can go dark really quick. Hmm. But have you heard of like the simulation theory about that this is a simulation that we're in? No. Have you not heard of that? I don't think so. It's crazy. It's like, <laughs> it's like the concept is that um, this is all a simulation. And if you, if you think about the fact that virtual reality is getting so, so good mm. that pretty soon th there, you won't be able to tell like reality from virtual reality. And if that's the case, wow then and then they have planet-sized computers or whatever and it, and it, and they can create like simulations that if you believe in the future that will mm. they'll be able to create simulations that are indistinguishable from reality wow right then therefore if that's the case this is a simulation then this is already a simulation because there'll be millions and millions and millions of simulations running and so to think that this is the original reality is kind of like like a one in a billion chance that this could be the original reality wow yeah it's like Listen, heady man, stuff i gotta go yeah <laughs> <laughs> we gotta wrap it up. i gotta wrap it up man <laughs> shit man i we love lost, you we thank lost you. another one <laughs> thank you i love you gotta fucking run what do you think of that though the simulation I, I theory i think it's uh, it's very compelling. Isn't it? Yeah. I love it. I love thinking of shit like that. I think it's fun as hell. Yeah, man. I mean, especially after, you know, an hour of running with that thank you, I love you running through your head and yeah. some hot yoga. and Yeah. But see, I, if I think too much about stuff like that, Simu I'll start getting anxious. Yeah. That'll, it'll, it'll get too heavy and, and difficult to grasp. But I like it. Yeah. I like it. What do you it, do with it? It though? wakes up critical thinking. Mm. And you then, know, we're, we're, and then we're, we're taught, like we're sort of taught not to be critical thinkers hmm. by society and by, you know, it gets, if you are a critical thinker, it gets labeled conspiracy theory. So you, yeah. it's like, you're a nut. You're a nut if you critically think of these things. Right. If you critically <laughs> consider real, the reality in front of you, you're a fucking nut. Just believe <laughs> what we say it is. What we tell you, yeah. This is what it is. Believe us. You know, and the minute you think about it, you're like, you're a nut. <laughs> what are you, insane? I have a couple band members that are in the back of the van <laughs> talking, you know, they're pretty amazing critical thinkers. But yeah. after a while, the conspiracy yeah. theory part of it starts to, you mm -hmm. know, overtake everything. Yeah. And I, I can tend to sort of like just need to go to sleep. Right. Listening to it for hours, you know, depending on. What do they do? What do they talk about? Oh, you, you know. Conspiracy theories about everything. I, I wouldn't. I have tuned it out. But like, like uh, what? What's your well, favorite? Well, you know how how Trump really got elected. Uh, you know who the dark, the, what the dark forces were that the made new, that happen. New world order. Yeah, type stuff. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Which I'm not saying I think is wrong. Right. Just after a while, when you know you have to go on stage and put on a show. Yeah. That isn't what I want to be thinking about. Right. <laughs> yeah, because not can, then it can get uh, it can get depressing. Yeah extremely yeah uh, yeah i don't like it for that right i mean if it's a sim if this is a simulation it doesn't really it kind of just i don't know that doesn't depress me the concept it doesn't really matter on some level mm. it's like <laughs> it's like semantics on a on a on a crazy degree yeah simulation or not it's still life it's still your one shot <laughs> you know you definitely went somewhere that is is not where my mind goes but I live in that place. I, I dude, <laughs> amazing. And is I don't that, know how it, amazing it is. Well, but. it is. I mean, is but because you're incredibly creative, mm -hmm. so it's it's working. Something, yeah. all of this is working. Even your depression, yeah, is working. It's forcing you to look at stuff. Well, I find when I get depressed, I start writing a little, and if I get a little bit out of balance and a bit depressed, yeah. I do write better songs. I feel like. I and are say. they necessarily sad or not really? <clears throat> not necessarily. Yeah. But I turn to music mm -hmm. in a way that's like of necessity. I get it. Yeah. Herman Hess. Herman Hess. So, so what were you listening? To? So, were you, basically, when you were twelve, is it, did you have a guitar or what? Like, yeah, that was my first instrument. At twelve or right yeah. then or like eleven? Did you get it after your dad passed or right before? Right before. Yeah, yeah, probably when I was around 10. 
and I started, you know, try to write some songs. I mean, I was already really moved by songwriters. Who? Let's see. Who would I have heard or when I was 10 or 11? I mean, first of all, everything that was on the radio at the time was almost everything was compelling from the temptations to Burt Bacharach songs, the four tops, four tops. I love all the of four that. tops. Yeah. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Um, but you know, Neil Young and Joni Mitchell and Paul Simon and Van Morrison and all, all those guys were at that age for me, were like, wow, how do you, how do you do this? I remember, you know, the record after the gold rush. Fuck yeah. Um, that's his, one of his best one of his best he was 24 records. then I think isn't I that amazing yeah. so do you remember that Inside had a lyric sheet in his handwriting uh-huh. and I was so desperate to crawl into the portal that would allow me to do something that beautiful right and deep mm-hmm. that I got real obsessive compulsive about it and I started to count how many words were in the song after the gold rush and i put the total next to the title on his lyric sheet interesting and then i numbers numbers i would count thinking that if i write a song with 147 words like uh tell me why or whatever how many words that song had that opened the record i thought well maybe that'll do it um that's interesting it was a weird approach trying to crack the code exactly whatever that meant to me as a kid but i knew i wanted in not just as a listener, I wanted to know how do they do that, and I'm still, still looking, you know, by mm-hmm. doing and listening, but it's uh, that's still for me the deepest music, you know, whatever I heard when I was th- that age. <laughs> do you remember the song "Angel of the Morning"? Juice Newton. Juice Newton, but originally Mary uh, Lee Rush. Mm. She had the original record, like in sixty. Eight, maybe 69 I want to mm-hmm. say so I was about 10 and that song for me was I it was a song about a one-night stand just call me angel of the morning brush my cheek before you leave I thought it was about my mom mm. so for me that was like to this day I hear that song and it's really wonderful and sad and I have a great sort of wrap up to that how deep that song was I was in Seattle doing a gig, signing some CDs, and there was a line, and this beautiful, older, very short woman said in a whisper, Mark, I hear you like my song. And it I'm was Mary Lee was, Rush. Oh, I no. thought it was Juice Newton. No, no. I'm just better, kidding. better. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. Don't fuck with my story. I know. Sorry. <laughs> and who was it? It was the Brady Bunch. No, it was, I mean, Juice Newton is fine. But well, you got to like check Juice out. Juice Newton's name. I know. Juice Newton. But I you, never, anyway. if you haven't heard the original record. What's her name? The, the original? Mary Lee Rush. Mary Lee Rush. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. And so what did you say to her? When I, I hugged her. hugged her? her? hugged her hard yeah and got a picture and it was beautiful that's awesome but yeah so i was listening to all kinds of pop music and then you know all the singer songwriters the beatles the stones the band band was huge for some i heard that brown record i just was also like transported i made a record um, with garth oh you did yeah wow ballad of boogie christ Ballad of Boogie Christ is the name of the album. That's the name of one of my albums. Yeah. And he's the uh, he organ plays player on organ and piano. Oh, I can't keyboards. wait to hear it. Yeah. Wow. So that's that's pretty interesting, though. Like, uh, so you just went into music then. Yeah, big time songwriting, and you were doing and, and you were doing the numbers thing when you were a kid, like that. Yeah. So I didn't keep doing that, but. Uh, I remember doing that because for me there was something really powerful about seeing the lyrics in Neil Young's handwriting. Yeah. You know, like on Sgt. Pepper, they were just printed on the back. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Neil Young, like very smartly, I think, it was such personal music. It was, for me, very cool to see his handwriting. It was another clue, another way to crack the code. What's interesting to me, too, is just the level of concentration and focus that sort of mm. um, relays. That's mm-hmm. really hard to come by nowadays because of this, like, you know, onslaught. constant barrage onslaught. Whereas, like, exactly. a kid could just, like, thinking about, like, opening up a Le- Neil Young lyric thing and actually counting the numbers and having to sort of go deep into artifacts mm. that are like limited amounts of of, yeah. of of material you know like yeah. that's what we used to do i know you know it's to be mourned space yeah it's like we had space yep 
And that's the that's the thing I feel like you have to fight for nowadays. Like you have to actively fight for space. And that's, yes, that's why yeah. Ho'oponopono and like the mm. and those kind of things to me are like they're sort of actively carving out that space where inspiration can come in. That's we're back to where we started. I mean, looking for you know when I, with four kids and all that stuff. It's like how do you find that space, especially now? But you can. I mean, you definitely can. Yeah. But I'm mi- I'm mi- just talking about that just now that, you know, whoever that 10, 11 year old yeah. kid was, it makes me sad. I sort of miss him because mm-hmm. I was so I was so focused yeah. on something that was deeply unknowable for me. Mm-hmm. There were no I didn't know any songwriters growing up. Right. Mm-hmm. Did you No. I didn't know anybody that did that. They no. were all like unreachable yeah. gods. Yeah. Um, so but you needed you you were you know introduced to so much loss and trauma mm. that at that point you needed something that was going to be big and amazing for your life to fucking work exactly and what a perfect time for all those guys neil young and paul simon to come along yeah and for me it That's was the best yeah perfect timing like thank god it yeah. saved my life that's wild yeah did you ever take lessons with the guitar and or you just, briefly? Because I know you, you taught yourself piano, right? Then you switched, I did. To, and you didn't take lessons there either. No, I taught myself guitar. I mean, you know, but that's not uh, it's not that impressive. I mean, I played today like I did when I started out. Well, that goes to uh, the Lucinda story. Where you, exactly. Yeah. I, I don't know what I'm doing, you know. Um, but yeah, I, t- I actually I. I played some guitar for a while. I wrote some songs. It was, I never spent a lot of time, I don't know about you, trying to learn other people's songs. I never could. My, yeah. I mean, my ear wasn't that good for Me that. Too. I had a friend who was like, he could, piano player. Jerry could do Ro- all that. Jerry Rosson. Shout out Jerry Rosson. All like, right, Jerry. He could fucking hear a song once and just go over to the piano yeah. and fucking play it and like also add like jazz. <laughs> com- Amazing, right? I mean, like as a kid, he was like that. It was Incredible. Cra- it was crazy. And but could I- he do what you do? Oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't, probably not, you know, like, yeah, we have our different skill sets, you know, because mine was like, I would be trying to figure something out and then there would be like two chords and then I would just go into my imagination and start writing my own song. Right. So then I was like instantly songwriting because out of laziness. Yeah. You know? I know, (laughs) man. Exactly. (laughs) But see, I wonder, I, I think that's exactly, it's part of what makes you who you are it gives yeah. you your style yeah exactly yeah no that's so it's not a bad thing but it is lazy <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> to so some degree what were your first songs like how and S- how? They sucked but did you record them or what some of them yeah my, Did you have a four track my uh one of my older brothers was going to ohio state i would visit him occasionally when i was really young and he had some sort of tiac <laughs> reel to reel because mm-hmm. he was a piano player and uh, he was recording himself all the time. But yeah, he recorded some of my early but was songs. Was it a four track or just a recorder? Those real to I think it was a four track. Oh, it was. Yeah, I think I was able to overdub. And, oh, okay. So yeah, it's a four track. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, some of those songs are recorded. They're not very good, but it's interesting. I already had like a really deep, raspy voice even yeah. when I was like 11. It's sort of odd. Yeah, your voice is great. Thanks. Yeah. Yours too. So, thanks, man. You're thanks. We both have those deep, yeah. gravelly, cool ass voices. Yeah. Thanks. Shout out to deep, gravelly, cool ass voices. And whoever gave us those. <laughs> yeah. It's like Paul Newman saying when somebody says what great, blue, beautiful blue eyes, he was like, thank you. I mean, I had nothing to do with it. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> Yeah. That's how I feel about my voice. It's like, a, not that it's like Paul Newman's eyes. It is kind of like Paul Newman's eyes. But I, I sort of, well, it's also, I'm feeling very close to you right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so when did you like get discovered and how did that happen? How did I get discovered? Or how, um, or how did you get, how'd you make it? It was your first album, like the massive album. Yeah. Like, yeah. What a clusterfuck that is. <laughs> it was kind of, <laughs> right? That's a, that's a very, um, that's a, a very interesting way of putting it. Yeah, it was a clusterfuck, and it was great. I mean, you know, while it lasted, it was great. Yeah. Uh, but how did I get discovered? I just somebody at Atlantic Records was had just been hired to find 
different kinds of music than what was already on the label. I Eve think he was Bove, did you know No, I did know Eve, you know but it Eve? wasn't him. Shout out Eve Bove. Yeah. No, this guy was Peter Kupke. Oh, Do you know okay. him? I sounds familiar. Yeah. He was really there I think to look primarily for jazz artists. I think Eve was jazz. Eve was jazz, right. Yeah. And maybe Peter was too, I don't remember. Anyway, he called me up out of the blue. There was somebody in a band of mine. Shout out to Jim Campagnola from my band The Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. He was a sax player and he got hired I think by Peter to be sort of a scout and uh jim gave him a demo of mine with four songs just me playing piano yeah that uh my friend ben wish and i started to make uh demos of just when i wrote, had a new batch of songs we would go in and record just very basic demos anyway atlantic got a hold of one and that was the beginning i mean getting signed to me was the end all and be all yeah it was back like, then back then that, it was like that was like everything. getting a viral video or exactly I was definitely it's like winning the lottery. You needed that. Yeah. I mean, that's like pre-internet. There was nobody that could hear your music outside of getting yeah. a record deal. Exactly. There was no other way. That you was the only game. Five cassettes to friends, and that's the end. Right. Unless you get a record deal. Like, exactly, man. The idea of making a CD even was like, whoa, that's way out the right. box. Right. You know? Exactly. <laughs> It's a different time. Different time. But wonderful, too. I mean, I had the same feeling back then, almost the same feeling I did about artists uh, where it concerned record labels. I mean, to me, Warner Brothers was like, that's where Ricky Lee Jones was and Little Feet and James Taylor. And to me, just the labels were magic. Mm -hmm. I was obsessed with that. And who's playing on those records? Who are these people? Mm -hmm. I I was obsessed about with all of that stuff. So the idea of like calling in some of the players that I knew from records that I loved Steve Gadd played on the record, and you know, lots of K- Keltner. I re- ultimately worked with Keltner on I my second with record. I on man. my second record. Really? Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah, T Bone Burnett produced it. Oh man, I gotta listen more to your stuff. You really do. I really do. This is <laughs> uh, no. Forgive me. I love you. Thank you. Forgive me. I do, Mom. I, <laughs> I totally do. But so, who produced your first record? Me and Ben Wish, this uh, a guy who was really a, a great engineer, who who approached me when I first came to New York and said, he heard my voice and he was like, "Do you write? Do you have any songs?" So uh-huh. we started working together. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we didn't know what we were doing, but it's part of what made that record work too. Right. Was I knew what I didn't want. You know, yeah. I had explored drum machine stuff and that wasn't for me. Right. Uh, you know, I just knew what wasn't right. And yeah. I knew I wanted it to sound as good in 30 years as it as it did that day. Yeah. How do we make this sound timeless? What are the instruments I don't want? What are the instruments I do that's want? That's good. Yeah. So that's how it started. And it's Keltner? Oh no, second record. Keltner's Keltner. on the second record. And then that's when I started my, probably my deepest collaboration with uh, a writer and a producer named John Leventhal, uh-huh. who happens to also be Roseanne Cash's husband. Right. Um, and John entered the scene on the second. He actually played a bit on the first record, but he was co-producer on the second record, uh, which I think is actually my best record. It's a record with a band. It's all the same players, Keltner, mm-hmm. Ben Montench. Uh, I follow Ben Montench. on Instagram. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> yeah. I have to start following you. Yeah. Ben Montench well, such a sweet guy. He's a, he seems like it's, a really nice guy. I've never met him, but oh, I feel like yeah. I know him just because of Instagram. Yeah, exactly. But I don't think I've ever met him in real life. Oh, you love him. He's sweet. Yeah. Have you talked to or heard from Keltner or played with him recently? Well, he may, uh, you know, not that recently. I made a record with uh, Danny Harrison and Ben Harper about mm. 10 years ago called Fistful of Mercy, and he played on that. Wow. So that was about 10 years ago. Do you then, love his drumming? Oh, as much as I, yeah. It's so beautiful, I, It's right? amazing. Yeah. And then he did a so I did a solo record with him after that called Graduation Ceremony. I got a lot of listening and to And he's do. on that. How that's many a, records have you one. made? Thanks, dude. Not many, man. Not many, fewer than you. I can tell that already. You've rattled. I mean, I think I've made five studio records, mm-hmm. and maybe, and then another one that's all covers. Yeah. Uh, but wait. Well, all your time three, off. Four. Yeah. Oh no. I mean, yeah. It, it just wasn't doing. Half. It did. I mean, it it impacted my touring life too. It took a while to build that back up. Um, but yeah. I mean, how many do you have? It sounds like you have twelve, thirteen. <clears throat> yeah, I think even more Including than side that. Side projects, wow. a lot. Yeah, wow. a lot. But I don't have kids. Great. You know, I, I wish I had <laughs> kids. I wish I want to have a wife and kids. That would be great. I'm Not throwing right. that out to the universe. Like <laughs> we're as, taking as, submissions on as the a request. We're taking submissions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I, I'm like I was telling my friend yesterday. It's like it might be too late, but I'm pretending like it's not. I'm approaching my it's life. It's not too late. Like it's not too late. Not at all, man. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. 
<laughs> you look like a young man to me. How old are well, you? Well, thank you, sir. I'm four, almost 48. Wow. Yeah. You look great for your age, but it's thank still not you. too late. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, not it. even close. Oh, so you just changed your verdict. It is too late. No, That's I said wrap, no. It's ne- I said it's not too late. I know, He's I'm a just product jo- I'm of joking. a 60-year-old father. Exactly. So. And I'm yeah. 60 now and just got engaged. Well, Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Mazel tov. Wow, Mazel tov. Yeah. Thank you very much. Wow, you look great. Thanks. I, I would have thought you were my, he, he my is, I thought you were my people age. people listening, Mark is fit. All right. <laughs> yeah, and he barely, like it here. and he barely tries. I, That's I, also what we've established. <laughs> no, no, I try. You go to the gym. I That's try right, with five that, times yeah. a week. Yeah. I, yeah. No, okay. Yeah, yeah you're got, right. Yeah, and my, and my girlfriend. 60, huh, man? My fiance. 60, you yeah. You look good, bro. Thanks, wow. man. And I'm not just saying that because you said it to me. I appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> but you. I think music keeps us young. You I know? agree. That pursuit. I, I agree. I mean, I, unless you get really fucked up and wasted and in yeah. bad shape. I, I'm kind of, I've been aware lately, like a lot of my friends, a lot of musician friends look really good for their age. Mm-hmm. And I only realize it when I see somebody else that's that age in a different profession. Mm-hmm. And they look different Mm -hmm. they look different the colors different it's not just about shape it's just i don't know what i'm searching for a word i can't find but they don't look as healthy keep that soul magic alive yeah and your soul lights up yeah you know and and there's nothing wrong with getting on stage going on getting into a room where everybody starts clapping yeah that doesn't happen in my kitchen yeah (laughs) really that happens in your in my, kitchen? Yeah. What are you doing, man? <laughs> Just when I wake up. Where's your to, kitchen? Just do a round of applause. I like wipe the sleep off my eyes and I'm getting a standing O already. <laughs> you should be an app for that. That's right. Right. That's Good what we you, need. Man. Yeah. Just on, on the HD TV, like just an audience going, yeah, yeah, bro, you got it. That should be your alarm. Joseph's kitchen. You know? That should Joseph, be Joseph. Joseph. Joseph, go, bro. God, he looks even younger. You can do it. You look, yeah, you can do it. But listen, that fucking Adam Sandler movie. I yeah, watched Rob Schneider. Does it in that was movie. in uh, Waterboy. You can, you do, can it. do it. <laughs> I predict the next time I see you, mm-hmm. you'll be engaged. Oh, really? Yeah, it's my I, prediction. I hope so. You've just put it out there. I think it, I would, you know how that works. Yeah. And you're I, ready? You want it? I definitely, Are there candidates? I, I definitely, I mean. <laughs> Come on, give it up. <laughs> I don't, you know, who I knows? Who, who knows? Well, you know. I hope so. <laughs> I hope there are candidates. I mean that you're aware of. Oh, Mark. <laughs> I see where we're going. You know, who knows? I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Good luck, man. It's definitely not too late. He's going to okay. be avoiding you for a while. I know. He will. Exactly. He'll be able, I hope I don't see Cone for a couple of years. <laughs> no, I, I mean, yeah. Because I used to be like that. Like, oh, I'm afraid of commitment, this, that, and the other. But now yeah. I want, like, I want, to me, I want to put that creative energy that I've put in my work towards a relationship and building life in other aspects. Because I, hear I you, think, man. like, when you're an artist, the, 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 the negative side or potentially negative side is you create a world that's a little too isolated because you are wrapped in your works so to yeah. such a high degree that you can kind of edge people out. Mm. And especially if you are overcoming, you know, toxic sort of psychology. Yeah, man. So, you know, because we keep like, you know, like psychologically speaking, recreating our past and, you know, maybe like, Hmm. We haven't had looking the great, for a different ending. Greatest examples. Is that why we do it? Maybe. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So how would you meet your fiance? Wacky story. Uh I won't tell the long version, which is what she enjoys. Uh I want the long version. Well, I was sitting with my eldest son, who's now 28, so he's about 24 then. Uh and I get a call from his mom, my mm-hmm. first my first ex-wife. And I can't hear her. She's at a party. It's a few days before Christmas. It's really hard to hear her, but she said something like I think I've I, I think I've met somebody you're, I think I heard about somebody you you're, you're going to want to meet. And I was like, "What do you mean going to want to meet?" Well, I'm just I'm at this party and there's a matchmaker here and I already knew, "Oh my god, this is this isn't going to end well." But you know me, I just had to find out what is this matchmaker? How does she do what she does? It's like the greatest job. You have to know my ex-wife to fully appreciate how great it would be for her to be at a party with a matchmaker. What does your ex-wife do? She's a fashion designer, jewelry designer and a fashion designer. Um, Very talented lady. 
What's that? Your friends, your friends. We're fr- check so check this out. So yeah, we're fr- we're friends, and um, she she says, I think I, I have somebody you want you'd want to meet. I'm at this matchmaker, and I asked her, what do you do? And she said, well, in the this morning I met with somebody. I don't know if she's going to hire me, but I met this beautiful, really talented woman, and I can't believe she needs a matchmaker, but. But she does. So I'm hoping, and, and my ex-wife was like, well, what, tell me more about her. Well, she's got two kids this age, this, and this age, the age of my two, two boys, two youngest boys. She has two girls that age, this woman. And uh, where does she live? Upper West Side. That's where I live. Jewish woman. I'm Jewish. Not that that mattered to me. Uh, what does she do? She works at ASCAP. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so the, my, my, ex-wife, my ex-wife is immediately like, this sounds like somebody Mark should meet. So she's calling me up and I tell my son, this is your mom on the phone. She's trying to fix me up with somebody she's never even met, Mm -hmm. but she knows about through a matchmaker. And my son is like, dad, this is ridiculous. Hang up. And then I said, well, okay, this is lovely. And about five minutes later, a picture came through and my son was like, you should call. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, really? So my ex-wife, my first ex-wife fixed me up. That's who this turned out That's to be. Genius. This woman who never, and she never needed the matchmaker. We went out a week later and that was that. That's incredible. Yeah. I, and we've probably been bumping into each other for 30 years how, on the Upper West Side. How long have you done her for now? Or we, now we've been together for almost four years. Wow. And just got engaged though. Don't really have a wedding date or anything. We're not in a rush to sort of merge our families, although our four youngest kids all get along great. Um, so it's a lo- it's been a lovely lovely thing. It is the healthiest loveliest love I've ever had. That's incredible. Yeah. I'm so happy for you. Thanks. And isn't it lovely that it's my ex-wife who sort of is it responsible? That's really Yeah. unusual. Uh, yeah, I'll say. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Very great. unusual. Yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to call that matchmaker. See what's going on. I'm going to give <laughs> yeah. gonna send your picture. Give her for my you. number. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what were you, were you single for a while before that or what? Yeah, yeah, I was single for two or three years. Yeah. Two years maybe. And yeah, and my second marriage was really, really difficult. Um, <laughs> I mean, obviously it didn't work, but more complicated. But listen, I have two, I have four kids all together, two from each uh-huh. marriage. And my kids are absolutely stunning human beings what do they all do? of them my oldest who's 28 is named max cone he works for comedy central he's a really funny dude and has written his first episode of the simpsons wow so he got that and he's we're all very proud of him he's trying to get a gig writing for saturday night live as we speak uh, he's written a few things for the new yorker in the shouts and murmurs column so he's really gifted um, and lovely. And my 25 year old daughter just had her first film, which she wrote and directed in the Tribeca Film Festival. Wow. And she's about to direct a video for my next, uh, for the single, uh, my single on the Blind Boys record called Work to Do. Mm-hmm. So she's doing a video for that. And then I have a seven, 16 year old and a 13 year old that are, you know, just growing up in the city and struggling with what most kids that age struggle with, but doing well nonetheless. Mm-hmm. Um, amazing to have a 16 year old, 13 year old boy at my age. They're just so filled with energy and, and uh, you know, like I said, they have their struggles, but they're amazing as well. I'm just really, for me, the greatest pastime is wondering what's going to happen to all of them. I mean, they're just remarkable human beings and certainly the older ones and now even the younger ones, you know, I can sort of see them going down their own roads. You know, there's not much left for me to do except love them. Mm -hmm. Um, The other day. That's a beautiful line. Yeah. There's not much left for me to do but love them. Yeah. That'd be a good song. It would be. You're right. Maybe we should write it. Yeah, that's a chorus. I took a. There's not much left for me to do. But love, love you, them. love them, or love you. <laughs> Maybe it should be directed at them, right? Nothing but much, love them. but love you. Love you, but yeah. love you. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. Probably. Who knows? That's the difference between a Grammy and not a Grammy. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's a very thin that's, line. Yeah. Funny. That's funny. That's why man. you won a Grammy and I'm still waiting, bro. Right there. Well, come on my boat. We'll win it together. All right. Well, you were nominated for artwork, Joe. Hey. All right, all right, all right. Come on. Come on now. That's nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, but it's not that, you know. It's not hey, that. listen, man. It's been 30 years. Yeah. Although, right. although I will say something I'm proud of, which we didn't get to. Do you know who the great William Bell is? The soul singer, soul writer. He wrote, You Don't Miss Your Water and Born yeah, Under a Bad Sun. Right? I, co- yeah. I co-wrote like five songs on his record. And it's a gorgeous record. Leventhal it produced it. New one? It's out? like two, no, it's like it came out two years ago. And it won Americana Album of the Year. I mean, how it, William Bell is Americana, I don't know. But, mm-hmm. but, but he got re-signed to Stax Records. Mm-hmm. He was the first artist on Stax back mm-hmm. in the 60s. And um, I, I, so I didn't win a Grammy for it, but he did, and I'm really proud to have been involved. involved. In it. Yeah, he yeah. was 78, maybe when he was. Yeah, or That's a couple, something like that. Couple Grammys. Under and the Blind belt. Boys were nominated for a, a Grammy for a tune I co-wrote for them. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. So I mean, I sense a pattern. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, being nominated is great too. They always say that, but it's true. You always yeah. prefer to win. But um, what were we talking about right before that? Oh, about about all I have to do is love them. I took this picture of my 13-year-old son. Um, I don't know why. It just really got to me. I, he was going to the subway to get to school. And this is the first year he he's going alone. You know, he doesn't want anybody to come with him. So that's a passage right there. And there he was, you know, walking away from me on, on the street towards Broadway, lugging his huge backpack, going to the subway. And I just had to take a picture of him from behind. You know, I was about 30 feet away from him at that point. And just the other day, I looked at that picture again, and it really got to me. It's like, there he goes, off. You know, he's Mm -hmm. off on his own journey. And like I said, there's not much left for me to do. Yeah, that's good. You should write that song. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, so um, what was it like getting shot in the head? (laughs) (laughs) Was it fun? <laughs> well, that was a sensitive segue, Joseph. <laughs> I know. I didn't. <laughs> um, what was that? I mean, listen, I, I'm fine with you asking that when I'm teasing you. No, I know, but what, it's like a horrible way to ask. But what, I, <laughs> there's no nice way to ask. There's no nice way to ask that. Remember like, when you got shot in the head? There's no nice way to Re- answer. Remember when you got shot in the head and, li- and lived? <laughs> like, uh, and wait, you still don't believe in God? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Touche, man. Touche. I mean, um, <laughs> man, you're fucking right. Shame on me. Shame Not on that me. many people get, you know. You're fit, right. You know. I'm rethinking it as we speak. doesn't have anything on you. No, you know? well, he does. He's got a couple oh, that, extra bullet holes. That's true. Yeah. But I'm just thinking but he's, the he, head he, shot. Like, he was never shot in the head? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Maybe yeah. he was. Sorry if that was insensitive 50 cent piece. <laughs> hey, <man. laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking about you. Yeah. Is that where we're looking? I didn't even I don't know. What's this? Oh, oh, you got a bunch going on. Yeah. Wow. Um, how did it feel? You want me to get this into something I don't think I've ever talked about? It's yeah. kind of a little deep and it goes back to remember when I told you the day uh, the day my dad died, he was acting really weird. Right. And wanted to make amends with everybody and Yeah all that i meant to and ask was, you if you did make amends with him sort of yeah i mean he showed up right at the airport right so that was kind of that was all that we needed yeah um i was in denver visiting my brother when i came home i came home from denver the day he died and we had our sort of moment of just you know seeing each other before he passed but i had just come from denver okay cut to all these years later, I'm in Denver, and I'm that every morning at that point, um, my first child with my second wife was about two years old. My fourth child wasn't born yet, and I was keeping a journal for him on this tour that I was on. And every morning I'd write to him. And this one morning, uh, I wrote to him there's something it was i think it was august 7th or something like that and i said something happened on this day but i can't remember what it was when i find out i'll let you know but it feels like a feels like this is an important day mm. 
And I just told my son in the writing, I'll get back to you on that. So to make a long story short, that night I get shot. Mm -hmm. And I only realize later that that was the day my dad died. That same date. And uh, that's insane. Yeah. And and right. Remember where I came from when we made up was Denver. Right. So. I was coming from Denver the day Dude, the my dad died. Simulation theory. Yeah. Is like, well, you're right. It's about stuff like that, like when yeah. it's like wild right. things, connections. Anyway, so I coming. could tell you what it was like to you know have a bullet in my head and never lose consciousness and watch the blood stream down. I mean, all of that was horrifying, and I had a lot of post-traumatic stress, and I went to therapy for it. Mm-hmm. But for me, the deepest part of it was the story I just told you, which was, oh, my totally. God, what is the connection? what is the connection of all of that? Yeah. Um, it's just it's too it's too wide it's, and deep to even process. It's wild. We can try though. We well, I'll go wherever you need to go with it. But I, I mean, I I well, feel like there's some something about that connects me back to my dad and yeah, obviously. Uh, well, it's that I nearly of, died on the day he did. Yeah, and it's on that day that something. I mean, I you got to think like as a twelve year old watching your dad pass with with a heart attack. Mm has got to be like you know the only thing that could like fuck with that trauma wise would be something like getting shot in the head like mm-hmm. that also would be like you know yeah uh, equal amounts of trauma i would yeah. think yeah it was a you know? it was a different kind of trauma I different mean, obviously yeah. but i mean still. listen when i went into the again i mean it's it's making light of it, and I don't mean to, but... I think it's good to make light of shit. Yeah, I do too. I mean, you could get too heavy with this, but when I went to the therapist to work on the post-traumatic stress, there was something very healing about finally going to the therapist and knowing what the problem was, you know? I mean, I yeah. knew what we had to work on. I heard you say that on Ellen. Yeah. Oh, did I? Yeah. There you, well, there you go. Yeah. So say, it's just, I, I mean, it, it, it was that was a heavy thing for me. It was yeah. like, because I'm still in therapy now. I'm still working out the mystery yeah. of it all. And why why did this impact me this way? And why does this feel, you know? And it, to me, it's, it's, it's important. It's an important thing for me. It's sort of like doing yoga or getting to the gym. It's the therapy. I, I, yeah, I need it. Um, is it like Freudian stuff? No, or? no. He's a real guy. We have discussions. He's not just sitting there silently shaking his head, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in judgment. It, we we have a dialogue. And he's a, an older guy, probably, I'm guessing, 10 years older than me, maybe. And he, there's something paternal about it. I'm definitely mm-hmm. getting my hit of paternal mm-hmm. stuff that I didn't get, right, from my dad. Yeah. Um, he's somebody I trust. If I have... You know, if I really have questions about something, am I doing this right? You know, he'll he'll weigh in, uh-huh. which I, isn't really the rules. But fuck it, <laughs> at this age, I've even said to him, "Can we break the rules occasionally?" And you tell me what you really feel yeah. <laughs> about this, because I'm 60 now, man. I, I I'm still trying to figure it out, but. It's not going to fuck me up for you to give yeah. me your opinion. Fast track. This. Right, exactly. Let's, let's fast, do the fast track let's therapy. Let's fast track Let's this, go. <laughs> like, I'm with you. <laughs> so how do you think that impacted you? The bullet? The, the bullet? The, 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 like what happened after that? Mm. You started writing I more? I started writing. Not the way you want to do it, but why not? You know, well, I think you probably also, if you... I, it sounds like you did some re- more research than I thought. Um, Talk about street cred, though. Getting shot in the head. Yeah, that's man. like That's like, you know. That's it was a, weird, man. That, that I mean, is. it's so, I think now talking about it, I can't even believe it was me. Yeah. I mean, what are we, re- who, who, do, who are we talking about? Yeah. The, um, I mean, listen, I was trying to get, that was the f- a tour, first tour I'd done in years. I was trying to get back on the road to feel safe again. Right. And then that happened. But it helped me to know, I knew that I needed to get back on the road pretty quickly or else I might never do it. Mm-hmm. Um, did they catch the guy who did they it? They did catch a guy. He's been in jail ever since. He's got a 36-year sentence, I think, for attempted murder. Wow. I remember his face, you know. Have you ever like talked yesterday. to him? Or? No, I'll tell you the weirdest thing. Is that, he a hippie? Because of Denver. He's not. I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> his mother has shown up at shows wow. to ask me if I would write a letter for him. I find it very, it's, it's write, write really hard for to try to get him to out. To get him out. Yeah, and I said, I don't know him, and I, I really need you to stop coming to shows. That oh really God, freaked me that's out. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, so. No, 
uh, he was high on crystal meth, I think they told me. But, you know, I remember him shooting right through the windshield of the, of the van and thinking that he, you know, he was going for the driver. He wanted the van. He was mm-hmm. trying to get out of town. Um, but he hit me. And I remember I took the wheel. I thought my, the driver had been shot. Mm-hmm. I had no idea I'd been shot for at least a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was incredible. It, it stopped just like a centimeter short of my skull. Mm. And there's just a little soft tissue in there, and that's where the bullet just rested, unbelievably. Uh, I could have been blinded, certainly could have been killed. Um, what, but what? I, I never lost consciousness because it sat in that soft tissue. And there was, was a hole a in small, my head. Was it a small gun? It was a 22. Like 22 yeah. Went through the windshield of a van. Right. And then grazed my tour manager's chin. Okay. So just the perfect amount, amount. of slowing down. Yeah. I you were alone in the car. So there was a bunch No, there of were four of us. Yeah. I was, I was alone in the second row, and I said to everybody, duck. And I leaned down like this. And, you know, I don't know what it would have hit if I hadn't leaned down. Yeah. But because I saw him, it just as I was leaning, it hit me in the left temple. What gave his mom the uh, yeah. gonads or whatever to like, or the to, entitlement? Yeah, to like, I don't to know. Ask you about that? Couldn't or, answer you that. She's a mother. Yeah, right. That's she's trying to help takes. her son, right? Right. But just, just she's like, I'm. His name is Joseph. I'm Joseph's mother. I knew immediately who she was. Oh yeah, his name's Joseph. Wow, oh, why'd you have to go there? <laughs> That's I, I didn't even think of it, man. Uh, but he's, what if it's me? I was the one that shot you this whole time. Like that's the now that theory like, from earlier <laughs> is just that, yeah. The, this is the Matrix aspect of this podcast. Is I was the one that shot Mark this whole time. And, <laughs> and now, excuse my, me, while I get a Xanax, <laughs> and now my mom comes through. It's like, oh, okay. thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Easy for you to say it's good to laugh about things. Oh, man. <laughs> Plot twist. I don't know. Did I give you the info you wanted about that? I don't know. I guess so, yeah. yeah. I mean, for sure. Yeah, it's just, uh, I, I mean, more, and then some, because just that whole thing, the lineup of the dates. Oh, um, man, that's, that's the, for me. That, well, and, and the writing of the record had sort of, there was also the thing you may have read about or heard about was that, I got shot three, about three weeks before Katrina. Katrina, yeah. So those two things happening, not that I'm from New Orleans, but obviously I love the music and the culture. Yeah. And uh, I was walking by uh, the TV and a news person was reading, this was also kind of a weird thing, was reading an op-ed piece that had just been in the paper about New Orleans and Katrina. And the line I heard was this time New Orleans is going to have to learn how to dance back from the grave. Mm. And I thought, that's a good song title. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me writing. And as it turns out, the guy that wrote that line was one of my, is one of my favorite writers, a guy named Rick Bragg, Mm -hmm. who wrote this piece in, I think, the Washington Post. But that I was already attracted to his voice without knowing it was him, his writing voice, Mm. um, was sort of interesting to me. Like, I it was proof. Oh yeah, I, I know what I like in terms of how people write. There's a consistency to it. Um, anyway, I called him up and he ended up, I said, I'd like to use a bunch of lines from this article you've written in a song I'm writing. So he's the co-writer on the tune. But that was the beginning of hearing somebody talk about Katrina as needing to dance back from the grave. I was like, that's what I need to do. Mm -hmm. Same thing, right? There's the parallel. Mm -hmm. And I started writing that record, Join the Parade. Uh, Shortly after that, that was the first first song I wrote for it. Um, So what a strange, odd, unusual thing that getting shot (laughs) kind of brought me back to the same place my mother's death did, my dad's death did, which was I need to write. Mm -hmm. Um, That's where it comes from for me. Unfortunately, it seems like there has to be some kind of trauma involved in order for me to get going. I'm trying to learn now, can I write something while I'm happy with my fiance and my kids and Maybe, you know, um, maybe we, we thought of some song ideas while we were talking. It's like there's nothing left for me to do but love them. Maybe there is a way to write and be happy. Well, trauma forces you to become the observer mm. because it's like, it, you mm. know, like it, it kind of forces you like like to sort of o- overlook everything because there's like a break in your pattern. Like it's like mm. it, it's a shock. You know, it's a heavy shock. It's a heavy shock. So then... Yeah. 
you're sort of, it, it kind of jolts you awake. It's kind of like, you know, where a lot of times we get into like just being unconscious, you know, and just like living in memory or like, or anxiety of the future or whatever, and not really being present. Whereas yeah. if, when you, when a, something traumatic happens, it forces you to reassess and to sort of wake up into the moment. Hmm. You know, are you familiar with Dr. Joe Dispenza? any of his work no he wrote this book called you are the placebo and becoming supernatural wow you got a lot to send me man are you remembering this yeah okay they're (laughs) incredible those are incredible those like his work is really incredible and he talks about how um you know like in order for for you to like sort of heal yourself or to like you know it's something I, i you know it's something about like trauma happening which you know like he he discovered he healed his back because he was hit by a truck training for Mm. a triathlon and like and had like this spinal injury that the doctor said like you have to like get surgery and but you're gonna have like one of those like stiff backs for Mm. the rest of your life and or else you you know you might never walk again and he decided like no fuck it i'm gonna heal my own spine and he would like what's his name joe dr joe Dispenza. dispenza Dispenza. Dispenza, yeah. Huh. And he and he then like just uh sort of visualized healing his spine like every day in the hospital for like he would just do these like massive hmm. visualization things. Wow. But the idea is basically and it, and it worked like miraculously it worked. And and the reason why he has his books called You Are the Placebo is because the concept Great that title. if a placebo works, then therefore your mind has the power to heal. And hmm. so but but it's like to to get to those places a trauma has to happen in mm. order for you to kind of like get into that eye of the tiger moment mm. you know because mm-hmm. it's like you have to reassess everything and it's like everything's on the line right and it's like from that huh. place you can kind of like up level your existence whereas if just things are just kind of rolling along yeah you're just going to be in a bubble you're just in your little weird unconscious right. bubble right so those moments are actually kind of gifts right you know well that was definitely what getting shot was i mean that was yeah. like popping the bubble big time it was like we walk around with a very uh with the incorrect presumption that we're safe mm-hmm. you know when at any minute you may not be and right. you don't know when it's your turn to lose the lottery yeah or to win yeah. I mean, in my case, ultimately it was a win. Yeah. Um, but like this guy, you're saying, you know, it took a trauma for him to get to that place. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, you know, if I got to a different place, but I was able to get back to a place where I was when I was a kid, which was needing to write again. Yeah. That, that was part of the way I, I work things through, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I was telling my friend yesterday, like, I'm just happiest when I'm on my mission and on point like Mm. and and working towards like the sort of my ideal vision for my future Mm. like then i'm happy in the moment like i'm happy in the here and now Mm. when i'm angling my myself in that direction and so if i'm laying back and fucking up and not really doing what i know is right i'm instantly not happy yeah it doesn't work yeah it doesn't I don't get the I don't get away like Bob Dylan says you're either busy being born or you're busy, busy dying. dying. It's yeah. like so true. There's no there's no gray. There's no there is no neutral. Like when people pretend they're just in this neutral zone, no you're you're busy dying then. Like mm-hmm. or if you're in a recording studio, Peter Gabriel told me like this a long time ago and I always believe, think about it and it's really true is like the energy is so sensitive you can really tell who's like working towards something or who's like mm-hmm. kind of like working against it, hmm. you know that kind of that kind of energy. And what is it when you're working towards something? What what is it you're envisioning? Like now, when you have those moments, is that the family part of you emerging? Yeah, like that, and just like I, I want to, you know, sort of create a life of abundance and um, hmm. and just so I can kind of give back and like I want I want platforms in which I can like think of these things that have helped me sort of heal my trauma and then Mm. sort of um, Mm. help other people discover those things. This is one of them, right? Yeah, of course. That's what this is all about. It's pretty great. Yeah, it's like trying to, and trying to build that more and more. Yeah. You know, and like just to be a light in the world, if possible. Man, that's fantastic. You know. Glad to be part of it. Yeah, yeah, you are part of it. Yeah, man. (laughs) Yeah. You invited me in. Yeah. 
but Thanks I don't do th- I don't do therapy though. Yeah, but you do. This well, is just therapy. did it. Yeah, this is therapy. Yeah, we just did it. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. And we got away with a cheap. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> so far. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Um, I agree with everything. Well, I, what you said about the bullet is when people have a near death experiences or almost die and are given a second chance. Mm. There's always that, okay, I have to do something different. I right. was given this opportunity. I was going to ask you about that, but then you said I went back to writing. So I guess that's right. Th- that's I'd like your uh, not like moment of clarity as to, okay, I, I'm alive. That's right. I, I have to be on this mission. Now. I'd be lying if I said there was a, a thing that happened, which was, okay, now I know my mission or, you know, that, that I was able in all the days that followed to have a deeper, richer appreciation and gratitude, it's intermittent, right. you know? I mean, you'd like, you, you'd you think after that, like you said, man, it's like, and you don't believe in God? I mean, there's a perfect example. You're right, why the fuck don't I? I've been given this incredible look into what not being here was gonna be like, mm-hmm. is gonna be like, um, in the most violent way, right? I mean, not even a peaceful thing. There's some people that just sort of have that life after death experience they see somebody in the tunnel and mm-hmm. it's either christ or it's their father or um i mean i didn't have any of that i did I, i'll tell you one thing i did feel very strongly that hasn't gone away the thing that you know some people would say well if it had happened to you because you hadn't had a family you might have felt god i wished i'd done that mm-hmm. um I already had, my priorities were already my kids, so it wasn't a matter of me needing to get my priorities straight, necessarily. Mm -hmm. But I did find, uh, I had a newfound appreciation for the fact that I had an audience. I had sort of taken that for granted. Mm -hmm. And I don't anymore. To me, getting into some town I've never heard of, if there's like a gathering of people that came to hear me sing my songs Mm -hmm. because they resonate for them, that's a deeper thing for me now. that was a that started then um so nothing it's not every day and it's it's not you know a deeper gratitude for everything but certain things intermittently um i got i got to see that that bubble isn't real it's pretty scary i got a deeper understanding of why i'm so fucking anxious cuz shit happens you know and there it was actually i've never felt i felt ptsd but I wasn't all that anxious when I got shot. I was scared, that's, yeah. but that's different. You know, like I said, you know what you're scared of with fear. Anxiety is a little more free-floating for me, and sometimes I don't know where it's coming from. But there you go. Interesting. Yeah. I, I also had one other question. Um, How can that be? Well, uh, by <laughs> just by reading your, your bio, uh, I was just curious, when you started, we talked about that earlier, you started as a session uh, musician. Sort of. Uh, sort of, and you yeah. went out with Tracy Chapman, which is what fascinated me. Well, I played me. on, I, I didn't go out with, you mean on tour? Yeah. No, I just, I didn't go out on tour with her. All I really did was I, I sang on other people's records. Um, I sang sessions for Jimmy Webb. You know, when he was trying to do demos or Lieber and Stoller, I sang commercials. I sang whatever anybody asked me to sing. I got, I was very lucky um, that I was able to use my voice in that way. Um, Tracy Chapman, I, I was about to do my first record with her producer. It didn't work out, but he asked me to play piano on one of the tracks. So that I'm not even singing on that record, but I did play piano. Um, so that's... I did have sort of a, a life as a session singer, I suppose, for a few years. But ultimately, that they called that kind of thing, they call it the velvet trap, because ultimately, it's not that gratifying. Um, and it wasn't for me after ad, a couple years. Ad money years. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was like, I, I felt like I was using my voice for the wrong purpose. Mm-hmm. So uh, I left. And it was kind of amazing. Everybody was like, you're crazy. How could you leave this? And it was fascinating. Another moment of good timing in my life and maybe another reason I should believe more than I do in God but I'm not even suggesting that you should by the way no like, but that's I, my belief is so yeah. free flowing that way that but it's, it's interesting like, it's like yeah if you don't that's like but it's an interesting enough, thing to think about this is a wild universe I get it why people don't but I'm just right. saying I need it you know no, I get it I get it but it's, the wild timing for me was 
um, I quit it when it was at its height. And everybody said, what are you going to try to get a record deal? I was like, yeah, I'm going to try to get a record deal. Everybody thought I was nuts, but I did get a record deal. But why couldn't, you do, well. why couldn't you do both? Because those sessions. I didn't feel things, I could. Right. I don't know why. I just felt yeah. like I had to, it was, I was done. I was done. And amazingly, when my, about a year after my record came out and I was on the road, all that work was gone. You know, so it was like, I wasn't crazy after all. I actually had a pretty good instinct that had nothing to do with what was the smart money or career move. Mm -hmm. It was just something I had to do, and it worked out. You worked with David Crosby too, right, didn't you? I, uh, David's become a really good friend, yeah. he he. They, shout out David Crosby. Shout out David Crosby. He, um, he's been a great supporter of mine, and... and uh, he and Graham both recorded a couple songs of mine that I never put on my records, but they always came looking for tunes, and I always seemed to have one. That's amazing. Or I wrote one. Yeah. Um, I wrote a song especially for David called Old Soldier, and then they did another song of mine called I Surrender. They've I opened up for Crosby, Stills, and Nash for a while, but way back when. That's amazing. Um, amazing, yeah, and he's just been a lovely friend. He's one of the guys that got me back out on the road. He was one of the guys that said, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Go do it. Mm -hmm. um, so he's yeah, been he's really got that no nonsense totally way about him. Yeah, yeah, kind of intimidating. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Did you meet Neil Young? Uh, just briefly said hello. No, never met him. Yeah, really. Because he's another one. No, no, I haven't. But he's another one that um, when his best songs, they just sound effortless. Oh, you know, they just sound like so amazing. Easily written, yeah, in a way. But Jackson Brown too, who's become a good friend. I don't know if you're a fan of his, but yeah, of the, course. Those songs, great songwriter. Oh, just amazing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So what's next? It's been like I don't know how many years since I made a full album of original songs. Yeah, this, this I feel like that's what I want you to do. That's I want you to go. I want you <laughs> to find that be right. beginner's mind and just mm -hmm. crush. I know you great. can. I know you got it in you. <laughs> you, Man, can it. You, you can do it. You can do it. it. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> uh, from your mouth to God's ears, man. I want I that. I hope so. I think it's Thank coming. You. I hope so. Why not? Why not? Just write ten crushing songs in the next. Do it before. Do it like by. Give yourself one month. One month from now, ten new crushing songs. And what what would be the way you would attack that? What would you? do? I would just go like strip away everything and forget, but you know, get your guitar, your piano, however you want to write them, yeah. and just like, you know, just like, I did this thing where I was just waking up every day and writing a song and making sure I wow. just wrote one song, and a lot of those made my new record. You know, really. Mm -hmm. And you would actually be able to finish a song in a day, I, or you I kept just going back. I made myself do it. Like if you make yourself do it, you can do it. And what was the percentage of good to suck? They were. I think they're all good. <laughs> Honestly, I think like I think that's pretty fucking. Amazing. I think they're all good. Like they're just good songs. I don't know. They're not. Maybe they're not all great, but they're all like good. I mean, you know how to. Write. You could write a good song. If they're like not not to Will say, I be not to say this though. though this might be a sensitive thing to say to you, but <laughs> if I put a gun to your head, <laughs> I mean, why? Why would you think? <laughs> That's weird. Okay, go on. <laughs> no, but you know, like I don't know, just like yeah, that beginner's mind. I don't know. I'm feeling inspired in that direction, so maybe I'm just like projecting. Well, but, good. I'll take it though. I'll even yeah. take the projection and run with it. Yeah, I'm feeling that like when you get that beginner's mind and you just like, you know, let's just do this. Let's like keep it simple. But did you have did you have any thought about okay, but do you knew what you did you know what you were going to write about or it just all started flowing i decided to, i and, decided to approach songwriting in a kind of a this was a period i'm not doing this right now i'm actually right. writing in a kind of different way right now which mm -hmm. is which is more based around this guitar Finger playing yeah. thing so it's a i'm on a different sort of trajectory that way but when i did that and this was about i don't know six seven eight months maybe even longer ago yeah like it was oh it was the last i was lo leaving my place in red hook and my studio in red hook and i was mm -hmm. about to lose the piano i had in there which was, so mm -hmm. i had one more month with this studio with and set up and i decided i'm going to write a song and record it every day in this wow. space as a way of saying goodbye to the space oh that's great and i decided to approach the songwriting in a in a sort of more analytical like 
methodical way, like hmm. trying to write like strong like pop songs hmm. kind of thing. Like, and did you make that record? Yeah, I mean, it's it, a couple of them. A few of them are on my new record, and then there's gonna, and then I have a bunch like in you know in the sort of archives or whatever that wow. I'm sure will see the light of day. Any of them that I could sing? Yeah, I'm sure, mm. of course. But I that goes that goes against what I my dream. What you for want you. from me? Yeah, but but Joseph, I, but, but, I, but Joseph, I, I can't live strictly by what your dreams strictly are. By my for dreams, me. you no, can't. I have no. You have your own dreams. I have a few. Yeah. <laughs> Hey man, I you know I would definitely send you some songs, or I would love to c collaborate with you. Let's try it. I would be great. It would be man. Yeah, maybe like one of the, maybe one of one of those songs that we talked about. Even though the all I've got left to do is love you, or something like that. Yeah, we can like hear what we said. Yeah. Back then. But what were you about to say? I, know, I don't think the two of you know, but when I booked Mark on this and got talked to the managers, they were trying to get you guys to tour together for a while. Really? Yeah. That would be cool. That would be cool. Yeah. Even cooler if we can come out and sing a couple songs we wrote. That would be rad. <laughs> yeah, we should do it. Yeah, man, that'd be great. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't. That there uh, you go. You know. Yeah. They were like, yeah, actually, we were trying to get Ma Joseph out with Mark. Nobody for, ever told uh, yeah. me that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's the idea this is, is all for if a you if you approach yeah if you approach like it from that sort of. I don't know. Just I was approaching it like a job, like um, mm. what do you call yeah. it? Like and and just to trick myself into it. It's just another another way of sort of tricking. But yourself there we're back into to that that book. That, uh, yeah, War of Art. Yeah, is is? yeah. It's like because like that with, resistance you know, is what the, you got to get. The break Beatles down. were like you know they were like you know they were trying to write hit songs. It's like yeah. people think of like the, oh that's like a dirty word to say or like you know like. When you approach it like that, there's something to that yeah. that's kind of cool. Man, when you mentioned the Beatles, mm -hmm. you know what just came across my mind? What? I do believe in God. <laughs> right. When you mentioned the Beatles, I'm like, what else could that be? Yeah. I mean, it, you can't even wrap your head around those guys meeting and yeah. doing what they did. Yeah. For, and the, the growth. Uh -huh. and, and, I mean, over those, I mean, everybody knows this, but the minute you said the Beatles, I, you know, I went to see that movie about... Um, wasn't a great movie but you know where no, nobody remembers that the Beatles existed right and this kid tries it, to pull the wool over everybody yeah yesterday but you know it, it's got me thinking more about them recently but yeah man I mean that that's there's God working in all of that for sure yeah I agree uh, but not just that yeah no it's beautiful Maybe it's God working in this I think so <laughs> who knows yeah ho'oponopono yeah there you go yeah Thanks for having me. Thanks yeah. for doing it, Mark. My it was pleasure. great, great to have you Fantastic. on. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Really I guess that nice. feels like a good place to wrap yeah, it up, yeah. right? Um, when is your the Blind Boys album coming out? Or is it's it out? out. It's out. <clears throat> oh, it came, came out, out in out August, couple, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. came out in August. So there's a few original tracks, studio tracks at least, and then the rest is live uh, from this one night we had in Connecticut somewhere that was made into a PBS show. Uh, but yeah, I'm doing uh, doing a few more gigs with them, but pretty much that that cycle seems to be done for now. But man, singing with them on stage, especially looking it's over, be insane. oh man, it's uh, there's pictures of me where I, I barely recognize myself. I look mm -hmm. so happy. Yeah. <laughs> I just la I I love this the way they sound i don't know if you have this response but when i hear something that i really love yeah. i often laugh yeah. it makes me laugh oh yeah uh, maybe that's that young kid i have to call in from yeah. the video store <laughs> um well, it's got to be a trip singing with a former president too <laughs> I, mean. I somehow knew you were that was going to come back <laughs> uh, thank anyway, you man thank you so yeah. much man appreciate it was really you. a pleasure it was fun mark I enjoyed it well, yeah. Thanks. We'll see you again. I hope. And let's write something. Yeah. We'll have some songs and you'll have a wife. I hope so. <laughs> All right, everybody. See you later. That was great. Hi, this is Joseph Arthur. Thanks for checking out Come to Where I'm From. Please support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash come to where I'm from. We are an independent podcast and any contributions you can make are greatly appreciated. <laughs>